Border lines are drop dead gorgeous. They are gorgeous, and you drop dead. So, to prevent this unfortunate outcome, do yourself a favor and listen to this video lecture. What are my qualifications? I'm a long time admirer, lover, husband of borderline women. And I had survived to tell the tale, which not many men can say. So I have a lot to share with you as to how, how I had coped with these women and how somehow I succeeded to maintain relationships short and long over the span of almost 35 years. I'm also, incidentally, a professor of psychology and the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. And today we are going to discuss a variant of narcissists known as borderline, people with borderline personality disorder. Now, throughout this video, I'm going to use the female gender pronouns. I'm going to say she, he, I mean she, her, etc. But of course, there are males, there are men with borderline personality disorder. Actually, we have a creeping understanding that there are as many men with borderline personality disorder as women. And I even came up with a new diagnosis, covert borderline, which fits, I think, the male variant much better than the classic borderline. So whatever I say in this video applies to you, madams, women who live, who exist with or married to uh, borderline men. But for convenience sake, I'm going to continue to use female gender pronouns. Okay, before we start, there are effective interventions and treatments for borderline personality disorder, and I encourage those of you who are afflicted with this personality disorder to seek help and to subject yourself to, diagnost to dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, to mindfulness techniques, they have proven to be very effective. But what I want to do today is share tips and advice on day-to-day -day pedestrian survival with a borderline. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to describe features of borderline personality disorder, how they affect da daily life, and how you can cope with them, manage them, survive, should worse comes to worse. Let's start with the most basic foundation of borderline personality disorder. It's known as abandonment anxiety or separation anxiety. The borderline anticipates and projects and believes and foresees imminent abandonment, humiliation and rejection by her intimate partner. Just allow me to change my chair because I'm sitting on a squeaky chair. And squeaky, squeaky chairs are great metaphors and allegories for relationships with borderline. So, I'm on a more stable chair right now, and I can proceed with this presentation. Abandonment anxiety, separation anxiety in borderline causes the borderline to preempt the abandonment, causes her to initiate abandonment. It's like the borderline is saying, I'm going to abandon you before you abandon me. The problem with borderline is that she interprets every behavior as a form of abandonment. If you're on the phone for too long, you're abandoning her. If you're going on a business trip, you're definitely abandoning her. If she wants something now, and you're not dis at her immediate disposal, dropping everything else you're doing, you're abandoning her. She interprets everything as rejection. And that makes life with her very mercurial, very unexpected, and, and to some extent, terrifying, a roller coaster. So, in your relationship with the borderline, you need to establish rituals and procedures of presence, of permanence, of stability and predictability. All activities that can be misinterpreted by the borderline as forms of abandonment, abandonment and rejection, you should aim and strive to do these things in her presence or together with her. You should involve her somehow in these things. When you are away, you should call multiple times a day. You should tell her that you're thinking about it. You should tell her that, you know, she's constantly with you. 
in mind and spirit, if not in flesh and blood. So you should, when you're with the borderline, you should establish a circumference, an ambience of presence, constancy, permanence, stability, and predictability. You should engulf her. You should engulf her and encompass her, but not overbearingly, not domineeringly, not, not by way of possessing her or controlling her or micro-controlling her, because that's the paradox at the heart of borderline. The borderline is terrified of abandonment, but she's equally terrified of engulfment, of enmeshment, of disappearing, of vanishing into, into you. So if you are too much in her life, if you're too intrusive, if you are too much of an invader, if you try to micromanage everything she does and says, everyone she meets, she will resent you for it and she will react by acting out. It's a very, very delicate balance, a very thin uh, line, a, a thin wire uh, between broadcasting to the borderline that you are there for her, that you will never abandon her, that you're not going to fade away, that it's okay um, to be away because that doesn't mean you're not coming back. Broadcasting this to her, establishing your physical presence in her life unobtrusively and unintrudingly on the one hand and not becoming an overbearing, overweening, uh, all-pervasive, ubiquitous figure, which she is going to resent and, and react badly to. This is the first problem. Second issue is object constancy. The borderline is unable to maintain object constancy. She has something called object inconstancy in common with the narcissist. In other words, when you're out of sight, you're largely out of mind. This is what makes it possible for the borderline to behave recklessly or, for example, to engage in promiscuous sex, to cheat on you. Because when she's not with you physically, you're gone. You're out of her mind. She, she, she doesn't have a stable representation of you, which she can interact with when you're not there. The narcissist has a snapshot of his intimate partner, but the snapshot is so far diverged and so far removed from the reality that even the narcissist suffers from object inconstancy. So the borderline needs your constant presence, physical presence in her life to remind herself that one, you exist, and two, you are lo she loves you. The borderline's love and the borderline's ability to have object relations um, is very, very infantile. It's like a baby with mommy. When mommy leaves the room, the baby starts to cry because mommy is out of the room. Mommy is gone forever. It's never coming back. It's like mommy is out of sight. Mommy is out, period. Now, of course, object inconstancy, inconstancy leads to severe mental health ramifications and implications. It is one of the core elements, the core pillars of what we call identity disturbance. The borderline is unable to maintain a stable core of identity. She is a kaleidoscope. She is shape-shifting. She doesn't have a central pivot, an axis around which she revolves. You can't put your finger on what is or who is the borderline because there's nobody there. There's a bit of an empty core and because it's in flux. Uh, Heraclitus, the famous uh, Greek philosopher, said pantare. Pantare means it all flows. It's like you can never step into the same river twice and you can never interact with the same borderline twice. Identity disturbance means that you cannot pinpoint the borderline. You cannot hold her, hold her into anything. Her promises mean nothing. Her values are transitory. She acts in contradictory ways. She violates her own self-imposed rules, limits and boundaries, which mean nothing. They mean nothing because her identity changes all the time. She is not the same person all the time. This emptiness at the core of the borderline means that there is nobody there to regulate anything. 
So she can be, for example, adamantly opposed to cheating, but then she would go on a cheating spree. She can be financial, hold herself financially responsible and then reckless, recklessly spend the entire fortune of the family. You cannot trust the borderline to display a behavior which is consistent with any set of beliefs or values, with a worldview, with limits, with boundaries, with rules. It's a chaotic sin, and indeed we call the borderline personality a low organization personality, a lowly organized personality, a chaotic personality. Even high functioning borderlines have an identity disturbance. Because borderline, therefore, is as close as you get to multiple personality disorder, to dissociative identity disorder, and because borderline is indeed founded on dissociation, as we will discuss a bit later, you need to introduce object constancy into the relationship. You need to help the borderline to stabilize her identity around you as an object. You can become the pivot or the axis or the core of this or the center of the dynamo of the borderline's identity. Very simple things like mementos. Give her personal items of yours so that she can hold on to them when you're away. Many borderlines, by the way, carry such items in their purses to remind themselves not to cheat with other men. Uh, Establish a, a routine of programmed reminders. Say good morning every morning, say good night every night. Send messages on a regular sketch, uh, schedule every, every hour. Uh, call her out of the blue, but make it programmed. In due time, convert these activities into rituals. Rituals with timetables, with schedules, so that she can develop a sense of predictability and object constancy, programmed reminders, mantras, slogans, sentences, which you share with the borderline. And when you say this sentence, it triggers you, it triggers your existence, it triggers your presence in her mind. So sentences which are common to both of you, which evoke a meaning which is, which is shared only by the two of you, a closed universe, very, very, almost like a shared, shared psychotic disorder, if you wish, or a shared fantasy in the case of the narcissist. So, in these sentences, when you say these sentences to her, she is reminded of your presence, of your existence, and of your meaning in her life. The next problem with with borderline is decompensation. Borderline personality disorder is um, an extreme form of infantile defenses. Exactly like the narcissist, narcissism is an extreme form of the fantasy defense. Borderline is an extreme form of a series of infantile defenses, most notably splitting, projection, rationalization, and projective identification. So, the borderline is surrounded. It's, she has a wall. She has a firewall. She has a fortification, a fortress of ever active defense mechanisms. And the aims of these defense, the aim of these defense mechanisms is to falsify reality, to reframe reality, to recast reality in a way that will be egosyntonic, in a way that the borderline can live with, can survive. If the borderline were to face herself as she is, if she were to face the truth, she would not survive. She needs, absolutely, to render reality more amenable, more acceptable. And she does this by filtering reality. She impairs her own reality testing via her psychological defense mechanisms. So, under extreme stress, when she anticipates humiliation and rejection, when she is when she is, um, for some reason, discarded, when she has a fight with you, when you are busy, this is all very stressing for the borderline. These stressors cause a process called decompensation. Decompensation is when the defense mechanisms 
of the borderline shut down one after the other. Tuck, 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 tuck. All the defenses shut down. At some point, she is rendered defenseless. She becomes skinless. She has no protection and no isolation from her environment and from the unbearable and intolerable reality of her impending doom and catastrophized abandonment and humiliation and rejection. At that point, she falls apart. She even may develop a psychotic micro-episodes. In other words, very brief psychosis can last a few minutes to a few hours. And so you need to counter the borderline's propensity for decompensation. You need to counter it by using techniques that we that are usually used in, in tackling anxiety and panic attacks. Decompensation feels very much like a panic attack. And we had developed over the decades very, very powerful techniques to cope with anxiety disorders, anxiety attacks, and panic attacks. And these techniques include breathing exercises, including controlled breathing, breathing into bags, breathing with, with counting, and so on. I encourage you to go online and read about breathing exercises for anxiety and panic. It, they include journaling, encouraging the borderline to note down, to journal, to write down all her cognitive processes when she is anxious or when she is panicking. In other words, when she is decompensating or when she is panicking, she should just write down what goes through her mind. And then at the end of the day, she reads these sentences aloud to herself. So when she is in panic, when she is anxious, when she is about to decompensate, she notes down what's going on through her mind and she reads it aloud to herself at the end of the day. This feedback uh, is very calming, it's anxiolytic. These are examples of techniques we use in treating anxiety and panic, and they should be very effective with decompensation. Help your borderline to adopt these techniques on a daily basis. It might stall off, prevent or postpone eventual decompensation. When the borderline decompensates, she ends up acting out. Acting out is dysregulated, uncontrolled, self-harming, reckless behavior. And it is brought on by self, the self-states of the borderline. One of the main self-states of the borderline is a secondary psychopath. When the borderline is under attack, when she's stressed, when she's about to be, or she expects to be humiliated and abandoned and rejected, she brings forth one of her selves, self-states, which is essentially a psychopath. And that's a protector self-state. It protects her from pain. It is defiant. It's contumacious. It's angry. It's reckless. It's aggressive. And it gets the job done, the job of protecting her. The borderline has several self-states, and they are separated by dissociative walls. Now, the dissociation, forgetting, the dissociation is not always total, it's permeable. And this dissociation helps the borderline to compartmentalize. So when the borderline, for example, acts out, when she misbehaves, for example, she cheats on you, she is likely to attribute, if she remembers the cheating, because many times she will not, especially if she's drunk or, or drugged. But if she does remember the cheating, she will attribute it to her other self, she will feel contrite, ashamed, she will regret what she had done, but she would still defend herself by attributing it to another self-state. Her impulsivity and recklessness are compartmentalized. She would not feel fully responsible for what she had done, because it wasn't her. It was some other self-state that took over her. So she's likely to say, I don't know what came over me. I've never done this before. It's not me. It's not like me. I surprised myself. I shocked myself, etc., etc. You need to help the borderline to not act out because acting out is seriously dangerous. Cheating is the most benign option. She can do really, really crazy things. She can wreck your car. She can steal your money. She can. Acting out is simply being out of control. And because a psychopath, secondary psychopathic state, takes over, the acting out is largely antisocial and psychopathic. It's like you're suddenly, you suddenly find yourself 
married to a psychopath or in love with a psychopath. So you need to help her. The first thing you should do is decatastrophize. One of the main processes in decompensation and acting out is catastrophizing. The borderline anticipates unfavorable outcomes and consequences. She foresees humiliation, abandonment and rejection. So she catastrophizes and she's reacting not to reality. She is reacting to her catastrophizing imagination. She sees the future. The future is dystopian and bleak. And she's reacting to the future, not to the present. You need to bring her back to the present through a process called de decatastrophizing. You need to bring her back to the present. You need to ground her. You can ground her physically by hugging her. You can ground her verbally by reassuring her that you're not about to abandon her or humiliate her or reject her. On the very contrary, you're very much in love with her. You can bring her back to reality by re-establishing reality testing. Ironically, for example, by attacking some of her assumptions as untenable or fantastic or paranoid or delusional. So there are many ways to decatastrophize, but you must absolutely diffuse the time bomb of acting out by reestablishing reality as the yardstick and the benchmark of all her future behaviors. You can do this also by mirroring her. And she becomes aggressive and violent on the verge of acting out you can mirror her behavior mirroring has a very powerful effect on the borderline it calms her down she suddenly realizes what she's doing she's kind of wakes up from the stupor and the nightmare and she's back in reality another thing you can do is use techniques for impulse control redirect her impulses she wants to do a you redirect her to do b she wants to be aggressive with something you re redirect her aggression, re you rechannel her aggression and, and hurl it, use it in some other way. Redirection via reframing and via remotivation. There are many techniques for impulse control. Again, I'm not going to review all of them. You just go online and type techniques for impulse control. You when you witness the decompensation and the acting out of the borderline it's clear that she is not acting out the way a narcissist would or the way a psychopath would it's not acting out because she's emotionless because she has no empathy because she's vindictive because she wants to hurt you or because she's goal-oriented wants to take something from you her acting out is very clearly highly emotional she's hurt she's hurting she's bleeding and she wants you to experience the same pain. She wants to hurt you, not in order to hurt you, but that you could share the experience of her pain. She wants to have a shared experience of hurt with you, a universe of hurt where both of you will belong. So her acting out is about you actually. And it is the outcome of something we call emotional dysregulation. She she is overwhelmed by her emotions they're too strong for her she can't cope she's drowning and she's dragging you down with her you need to help your borderline with her emotional dysregulation number one teach her to talk about her emotions to communicate her emotions help her to verbalize her emotions number two ask her to label her emotions to call them by name because the borderline experiences her emotions as a cloud. The emotions are diffuse. Very often she doesn't know what's happening. She's totally disoriented. In many cases, she goes into a dissociative state. She depersonalizes, she derealizes, or she becomes amnesiac. At any rate, she is very hard pressed to say what's happening inside her head. Very often a borderline would tell you, I'm having a brain fog. It's a brain fog. I can't tell you what's happening. You need to force her to help her to col collaborate with her to label her emotions. You can ask her, are you feeling anger? Are you feeling envy? Are you afraid? You, you need to help her to, to, to call her emotions by name. When this is done, when she had gained an, a handle, when she had gained a label, 
she she calms down because just labeling the emotion uh, provides her with control over the emotion and her problem is dysregulation which is a fancy a fancy word for lack of control she loses control over herself labeling helps her to regain control then teach her to externalize her emotions ironically the borderline acts out because she bottles up she bottles up emotions she's very wary hyper vigilant and cautious she's very unlikely to communicate efficaciously with you so instead she bottles up everything she acts pseudo stupid she doesn't talk much or she talks about irrelevant things or she or she diverts the conversation or she she kind of digresses and you know tries to avoid the painful topics teach her to externalize her emotions behaviorally to show that she's angry to demonstrate her envy or jealousy to act appropriately other negative emotions or positive emotions so teach her to externalize behaviorally her emotions but also teach her to talk about her emotions and you can do this by using a variety of techniques one of the most powerful is known as chair work chair like what you sit on chair work you can ask her for example to put her anger on a, an empty chair and then to talk to the anger in the empty chair to have a dialogue with her own anger you can ask her to put her envy her hatred her fear on the chair talk to her abandonment anxiety interrogate the abandonment anxiety ask the abandonment anxiety for help chair work dialogue with the emotions via the the methodology and instrument of an empty chair and finally you can use techniques from cognitive behavioral therapy or you can attend cognitive behavioral therapy in order to negate in order to uh, counter negative thoughts thoughts the borderline has negative automatic thoughts which leads lead to catastrophizing and lead to despair and depression and anxiety the borderline assumes the worst and because she assumes the worst the worst outcomes the worst because of this she sinks into anxiety and depression anxiety and depression are very strong concomitants of borderline they are com comorbid with borderline very often and they are usually the outcome of these negative automatic thoughts, which are, uh, which CBT is very successful at eliminating. Learn the techniques of eliminating automatic negative thoughts or simply attend a few therapy sessions with her. Having learned to control her negative thoughts, having learned to label her emotions, having dialogued with her anxieties and fears, having verbalized what's happening inside her, having externalized her emotions via behavior, the risk of acting out, the risk of emotional dysregulation, and the risk of decompensation, these risks are much reduced using these techniques. One of the main problems with borderline is that she cannot, as she cannot regulate her emotions, she cannot control her anger. Borderlines are very angry, and they're, very, and they're angry in a very violent and aggressive way. You need to to learn anger management techniques. You need to teach your borderline to cognitively restructure. Cognitive restructuring is a major anger management technique. It is simply teaching the borderline to think about things in a different way, to consider triggers, stimuli, uh, provocations, fears, frustrations, to consider all this in a totally different way, maybe as positive opportunities for growth and learning, for example. Cognitive restructuring. Establish communication protocols, very rigid and strict communication protocols. If she wants to say something, she has to say it according to the protocol. No personal attacks. No attacks on the other. Like, if you want to say something, for example, if you want to say, what you're doing is hurting me, don't blame, don't accuse, don't say, the way you're misbehaving is, is really bad. Instead, say, I'm in pain. Talk about yourself. Don't talk about her. Describe your own reactions, your own internal state, rather than attacking her. That's an example of a communication protocol. Establish communication protocol and adhere to them religiously. 
Communication protocols are very powerful tools which prevent a lot of misunderstanding and pain down the road. Finally, introduce humor. Humor is the best antidote to anger. Whenever she's angry, don't mock her. Don't invalidate her anger. Don't minimize her anger. Don't minimize her. That's not what I'm saying. But say something humorous that suddenly exposes the whole situation as irrational. And if she's amenable to humor, this will diffuse the anger. The borderline has what we call mood lability. Mood lability. She is, her mood is as dysregulated as her emotions. Mood lability can be countered with physical activity, a sleep schedule, a series of rigid routines. The routines provide structure, provide a skeleton, so rigid routines, and with stress management techniques. Again, I encourage you to go online and look for stress management techniques. So, mood lability in the borderline is a serious problem, mood swings. Very serious problem. Anyone who had lived with a borderline knows what I'm talking about. This is not like three days of, of fun and three days of depression. This is like one hour of, of fun and two hours of depression and then two hours of fun and three hours of anxiety and then three hours of rage and two hours... I mean, the mood swings are enormous and they are, they are never ceasing. And so, if you want to survive with a borderline, you need to regulate this. You, you need to control her moods. She needs to control her moods. And these are the, this is what I've mentioned, physical activity, sleep schedule, routines, stress management techniques. The, the moods of the borderline are reactive. They are not produced internally. They are most of the time, they are reactive. Regrettably, she, her reality testing is impaired. So what she perceives is very often wrong, very often deformed, very often um, inappropriate, inaccurate. So by restoring reality testing, you're going to reduce mood lability considerably. But because it's mostly reactive, you need to eliminate the triggers and the, and the stimuli and the provocations in the environment, and you need to structure her life. You need to help her to structure her life so that she can reduce stress and the stress leads to anxiety, and anxiety leads to mood lability. Reduce stress and you solve an entire chain reaction. The borderline outsources internal functions, internal what, what is known as ego functions. She outsources these to you. The intimate partner of a borderline is her source of regulation, is the one with the hand on the key. He is in control of how she feels, her emotions, her moods, her reactions, her explosions, her love. What the borderline does, because she lacks an, an inner, a regulated inner world, because her inner world is one gigantic, gigantic twister. What she does is she, she actually is telling you, help me by regulating me. Be my external control. Be my external board of control. Be my user manual. I'm transferring my locus of control to you, the borderline says. And from now on, you are my god. You are in charge of my moods, my emotions, my cognitions, my happiness, my unhappiness, my aggression. Everything I do, you are to blame. Everything I do, you're responsible and accountable for. Even if I misbehave, I misbehave because of you. Now, this is, of course, outsourcing, of course is extremely unhealthy. It's extremely unhealthy. First of all, because it is counterfactual. It's not true. A lot of the, a lot, many of the dysregulatory behaviors and, and emotions and moods of the, of the borderline have nothing to do with you as her partner. So attributing everything to you is scapegoating you. Don't let the borderline scapegoat you. Teach her to regain the locus of control transfer these responsibilities that she had given to you, that she had abrogated, transfer these responsibilities back to her. Do it incrementally. Do it gradually. Do not threaten her. Do not demand. Do not control. Do not chastise and castigate and criticize. Be nice. Be kind. She is not well. Help her to recover. 
provide her with increasing control over herself, her circumstances, her choices, her decisions, and gradually her emotions and her moods. Remove this locus of control from yourself and help her to regain an internal locus of control. At the same time, help her to develop and reward what we call autoplastic defenses. Autoplastic defenses is accepting responsibility for your actions and for the consequences of your actions. Alloplastic defenses is when we blame other people for everything that's happening to us. That implies an external locus of control. If you are to blame for what's happening to me, then I don't, I'm not in control of my life. You are. You want the borderline to regain control over life also by accepting responsibility for everything she had done, everything that's happening to her. And it can start with a very simple manipulation of language. Borderlines often say, this happened to me. You should tell the borderline, no, this did not happen to you. You did it. A very typical case is when the borderline comes and says, I was drunk and I slept with another man. It happened. So it did not happen. You did it. You did it restores a sense of responsibility, self-control, locus of control. Reward these defenses, reward this, um, be these behaviors when, when it's warranted, when she does something good, something nice, reward her when she does something bad refuse to accept responsibility reject any attempt to put it on you you're not responsible for her actions you're not responsible for her moods for her emotions for her cognitions for her misbehavior for her aggression for her violence never ever accept responsibility but do it lovingly because you love her do re-establish her sense of control and, and sense of personal responsibility and accountability lovingly. The borderline, exactly like the narcissist, tends to idealize and devalue. She idealizes you and devalues you on a daily basis. These are very rapid cycles. As opposed to the narcissist, in borderline, the cycling is very rapid. She can idealize you and devalue you, devalue you several times a day. The problem is if she, when she idealizes you, you're God. When she devalues you, you're the devil. And she doesn't feel bad when she is in the stage of devaluation. She doesn't feel bad to betray you, to cheat on you, to harm you, to undermine your interests. So it's very dangerous when the borderline is in the devaluation phase. Because in this phase, when she is devaluing you, she is controlled by a secondary psychopathic self state. She's a psychopath. You don't want the borderline to devalue you because she will damage you really seriously and badly. You don't want her to idealize you either because then her expectations are unrealistic and she's bound to be frustrated and disappointed and devalue you. You want to stop this cycle. You want to stop it dead in its tracks. You don't want idealization and devaluation. You want a realistic assessment of who you are, what you can give, what are your limitations, and you want this realistic assessment to be the foundation of your relationships. You want, in other words, to restore reality testing. Insist on reality. Whenever she says something wrong, counterfactual, correct her. Insist to introduce reality at all times, hundreds of times a day if you have to, repeatedly on the same topic if you have to. Restoring a reality testing is the only guarantee that your relationship will not end in a self-annihilating nuclear mushroom cloud, which is a typical way a relationship with the borderline ends, ask me. Maintain the entire picture. Integrate her splitting. When she says that someone is all bad, remind, remind her that this very person has good aspects, good traits, and had behaved nicely with her, was kind to her. Negate her splitting. Negate her projection. Act against her defenses. Do not let her idealize and devalue you or anyone else. Integrate splitting. Maintain the entire picture. Serve as a reminder. Serve as a database. Serve as a repository of the totality of experience. If she tries to, to divide experience into black and white, 
we call it dichotomous thinking, black and white fallacy. If she tries to develop uh, di divide people in life into black and white, reminds her that reminds her that life is actually gray, and that people are always in between, partly bad, partly good. Help her because she's stuck at a very infantile stage. She regresses to an infantile stage where mommy is all good or all bad, you are all good and all bad, etc. Help her to integrate. One major problem with, uh, with borderline, and this is the focus of dialectical behavioral therapy, frankly, is self-mutilation, which could lead to suicidality. Between 10 and 11% of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder actually commit suicide. It's an enormous rate. So the borderline self-mutilates. She can self-mutilate by classically by cutting herself or burning herself with cigarettes. This is dermatological self-mutilation on the skin. It's visible. But there are many other ways to self-mutilate. For example, she can sexually self-trash. She can self-trash sexually. She can, she can do horrible sexual things. Anything from, I don't know, gangbang to, to sleeping with disgusting men that she finds revolting. I mean, she just to trash herself. She can abuse substances. She can behave recklessly and as a way to self-harm. You know, if you drive recklessly, you may end up in an accident. So there are numerous ways for the borderline to self-mutilate, self-harm. The ultimate is suicide. You need to prevent this. And prevention involves recognizing the warning signs of suicide. And these include extreme mood swings, feelings of hopelessness, giving away possessions, losing interest in activities that hitherto she found interesting, talking about death or suicide, saying goodbye to family and friends, saying that everyone is a burden on her, she doesn't want to see anyone, so schizoid phase, withdrawing from friends and family. All these things are signs of impending, um, impending episode of self-harm. The problem with borderline is escalation. The borderline drinks one drink, she, she drinks 20. It's like alcohol craving writ large. So she can't, she can't regulate her behaviors. When she starts to do something, she has no intention to end where she usually ends. She had intention to have one drink. She, she ends up being in a blackout, alcoholic blackout. She had an intention just to flirt with a man. She ends up having sex with him in a dingy, sleazy hotel. She, she had intention just to drive in the, in the breeze, but she ends up wrecking the car. So she escalates. If you see these signs, they may lead to suicide because she can't stop herself. There's no regulatory mechanism there. So she, she starts with one intention and she ends up with totally different act. You need to listen. You need to be, you need to be attuned to her. You need to be like a seismograph. Do not judge her. Do not dismiss her. Do not discount or invalidate her feelings. Just be a good listener. Just sit next to her and let her talk to you. Encourage her and prompt her, motivate her and incentivize her to talk to you by being a kind soul, by loving her truly. Encourage her to verbalize. Encourage her to sublimate her aggression some way. Do something. Punch a bag. Write a book. Read a book. Watch a movie. Go on a walk. Physical activity is always very important in all these things. And the problem with the borderline is dissociation. She doesn't remember. Because she doesn't remember things, she can't learn. There's no process of learning. There's no memory. And because when there's no memory, there's no identity. And there's no identity, there's no one there to learn. So borderline never learns. It's infuriating because she keeps repeating the same thing, over, the same mistake over and over again. She keeps associating with the same people who had mistreated her, disrespected her, raped her again and again. She does everything again and again. The self-harm keeps repeating. The self-mutilation, the wrong choices, the disastrous decisions, the horrible people who had trampled all over her. She keeps coming back for more because she has no memory. She's totally dissociative. She lives in the presence in the worst sense of the word. She has, she's discontinuous. She has no continuity. Encourage her to develop continuity. Ask her to, have, to journal, to have a diary where she writes everything that's happening to her, everything she thinks, everything she feels, and then encourage her to read the diary the next day. So this creates continuity, at least cognitive continuity. 
journaling is a very powerful tool mementos objects that carry memories or associated with memories something with a smell something with a taste a visual thing that provokes a memory memory triggers like in the famous movie memento so memory triggers encourage you to place post-it post-it notes on the refrigerator on the door on chairs all over the house post-it notes to remind her of things she wanted to do things she's thinking about i mean there's a close affinity between borderline personality disorder and patients with early early onset dementia it's very reminiscent of some phases of alzheimer you need to re-establish continuity via memory encourage her to video record herself because video recordings are much more powerful than written notes maybe she should video record herself and keep these recordings for a few days watch them a few days later to establish this thin thread of memory and identity programmed reminders i mentioned before use them a lot remind her of this remind her of that ground her in reality by force by force of love and kindness drag her down she's floating she's like an air balloon you know a helium balloon drag her down ground her moor her in a good way tie her to your wrist keep keep her with you she's worth it she's worth it because most borderlines are beautiful intelligent heartbreakingly tender women she's worth the investment and the effort if you're up to it and finally borderlines have transient paranoid ideation and they're very likely to make you the enemy the persecutory object if you insist on introducing the borderline to reality if you try to regulate her emotions and her moods you're bound to clash with her there's bound to be conflict as these conflicts accumulate she's going to begin to regard you as the enemy we call it per secretary object she's going to begin to develop transient paranoid paranoid ideation about you, paranoia she's going to begin to suspect you of malevolence and bad intentions she's going to be wary of you she's going to be suspicious of you she's going to interrogate you she's going to spy on you this is common in borderline you don't need to worry you just need to take it in stride it will pass that's why we call it transient paranoid ideation it passes insist on reality testing when she's paranoid journaling question her doubt her counter her paranoia with your own paranoia mirror her use a secret code or an exit strategy and agree on it when she is not paranoid and when she is paranoid use this secret code or exit strategy or safe word for her to freeze and suspend her paranoia so when you say the word she freezes she doesn't continue with her paranoid ideation until it passes you need to counter all these things you need to fight being with the borderline is a prolonged prolonged fight on multiple fronts every possible front actually now some intimate partners some men because i'm using the example of a woman with borderline some men find it worthwhile because the borderlines have gifts to give which very few women do the borderline a typical borderline maintains her childlike pureness and goodness a, a typical borderline when she loves you you would never ever experience a love like that in your life it is total love she is immersed in you it's not like the codependent codependent depends on you so in the codependent there's a strong transactional element the borderline loves you essentially unconditionally like i would say a mother does but she loves you as a woman not as a mother a borderline is typically a woman's woman because she's very you know flirtatious seductive and so if you're into this kind of woman i mean she's a woman's woman there's a lot it's a treasure typical borderline woman is a treasure but the price is very high and constant and you need to be on your toes you need to walk on eggshells all the time most men would say the prize is not worth the price i'm one of the few who thought think probably will think in the future that the price is well worth the price i have paid a very big personal price for my exclusive choice of borderline women but whatever prize i had received made all the prices I've paid well worth it.
Not your cup of tea. Go away. Don't even start. Because you may, you may get captivated and trapped. Avoid contact with borderline women. They are very, very alluring and addictive. If it's not your cup of tea, walk away. If you can't do all these things that I just mentioned on a regular daily basis, hourly basis, I mean, just walk away. It's a full-time job. It's a full-time maintenance job. If you can, and you're up to it, a treasure awaits you at the end of the rainbow. Go for it, Dorothy. So, like many, you love your narcissist. You don't want your narcissist to walk away. You want him to remain in your lives. Because when you are with your narcissist, you feel much more alive. You feel that the world is full of colors. When he is away, when he is absent, when he had abandoned you, the world becomes black and white, dull, boring, predictable. The narcissist brings into your life excitement, thrill, novelty, adventure. It's very difficult without the narcissist. The narcissist actually reflects an idealized view of you. The narcissist makes you, in some ways, love yourself, or at the very least, love your life. And this is highly addictive. So I'm going to teach you how to keep the narcissist, how to not lose your narcissist, how to make sure that you spend a long time with your narcissist, as long as you wish. But before I do so, a disclaimer. In 1995, I am the one who invented the no contact strategy. Yes, I'm the guy who invented no contact. And for well over 10 years, until 2004, I paid a very dear price for this coping strategy because the entire profession, psychologists, psychotherapists, marriage counselors, everyone was attacking me. And they attacked me because they said, that the no contact strategy is cruel, is unnecessary, is wrong. Today, no contact is the standard advice. It's the mainstream coping strategy. Today you go to a therapist, a counselor, anyone, and they tell you, well, if you can, you know, cut your losses, walk away, dissolve, dissolve the diet break the relationship, break up. And to this very day, this is by far the best advice. It's much better than gray rock and any other color of rock. It's much better than mirroring, which is a technique that I also invented. It's much better than any known method to manipulate the narcissist or to cope with him. Just walk away. And it doesn't matter if the narcissist in your life is your son, or your daughter, or your husband, or even your parent, your mother, your father. Staying in touch with the narcissist is a process of osmotic, osmotic poisoning. The narcissist is like a toxic frog. It is aesthetically enticing, but if you touch his skin, he poisons you, incrementally, gradually, imperceptibly, until you shrivel and you die like a plant without water. Why would you wish upon yourself such a fate is beyond me. But there are some people, women mostly, whose emotional needs are such that the narcissist caters best to their internal processes. They get from the narcissist what they cannot get from any other type of person. Maybe they have a need to be mothers and the narcissist caters to the maternal instincts because he is an eternal adolescent, he's a child. The narcissist is a case of arrested development. Maybe they are afraid, these women are afraid of intimacy. They have a dysfunctional attachment style. This sits well sits well with the narcissist. His attachment style is anywhere between non-existent and dysfunctional. Maybe they 
Maybe they're a bit psychopathic or antisocial, and they like novelty and excitement and thrill and the lack of impulse control. The narcissist gives you all that in ample measure. So, some people have been conditioned by years of dysfunctional wrong upbringing to be with narcissists. There is even a subspecies of covert narcissists, the inverted narcissist, who thrives only when her intimate partner is a narcissist. She basks in the narcissist's reflected glory. She derives the narcissistic supply from her primary narcissist supply. She is like the moon to the narcissist's sun. Her light is reflected. So you can't generalize and say that no one should ever be with a narcissist under any circumstances. There are small groups of people, women mostly, who find the narcissist the only solution. And a diet with a narcissist, the only viable arrangement. So for these women, to these women and for these women, I want to give a few tips, insider tips, if you wish. Leaves from the narcissist user manual. How to keep him, how to make him happy, how to make him stay. And so the first thing is that, um, having said that my advice is leave now, leave before the effects of abuse, including complex post-traumatic stress disorder, before these effects become entrenched, and leave him before your children begin to pay the price as well. That's my advice. But if you insist on staying, always against the best interests of yourself and your nearest and dearest, here's a survival manual. Let's start with the five don't do. There's five don't do's. If you do certain things, you incur the wrath of the narcissist. You provoke his rage. You provoke his abuse. And his abuse could be up to lethal. You don't want the narcissist to be your enemy. You don't want him to consider you a persecutory object. You don't want to, to feel that you are deliberately frustrating him. So here's five things you should never do. Number one, never disagree with the narcissist. Never contradict the narcissist. Never criticize the narcissist. Never, if you can, speak if you're not spoken to. Background noise. Just be there. Nod your head. Um, adulate. Admire. Reflect back. Remind the narcissist of his grandiose moments, his accomplishments, his uh, claim to fame, his nine minutes of glory. That's your job. You're an external memory. You're an external memory. You, you're a repository of all the past narcissistic supply, and you provide secondary supply. You regulate the flow of narcissistic supply in the narcissist's life. You can't do that if you disagree with him or contradict him, let alone if you criticize him. It's bad. Never offer the narcissist any intimacy. And that includes never offer him advice. Never offer him a help. Never offer to help him. Never give him another point of view. Never suggest anything. Never tell him how much you love him. Never suddenly hug or embrace him uncontrollably, impulsively. Intimacy is a threat. If you offer the narcissist advice or help, it means that you are superior to him in some way. You know something he doesn't know. If you have another point of view, that means he did not consider all points of view. He is godlike. He sees everything. He knows everything. There's nothing you can contribute to him. There's nothing you know. There's nothing you see that he hadn't already long ago considered. And if you try to imply that there is, then you are challenging his grandiosity. You're undermining his self-perception and self-image. You are destabilizing the inner precarious equilibrium that it took him decades to establish. It's bad news. You're bad news. You're becoming bad news. Intimacy does the same because when you offer intimacy, what you're saying is 
I know you. Intimacy is founded on knowing the other person. You, you can't have intimacy with a total stranger. You, intimacy develops and evolves and is a derivative and a byproduct of getting to know each other. But the narcissist, like God, is unknowable. Who are you to know him? You don't have the necessary intelligence. You don't have the necessary skills. You, he's above. He's above you. He's so much above you. It's like an ant trying to understand uh, a human being. The gap between you is so enormous. You're a chimpanzee. He's human. I mean, there's no way you can really know him. You can guess, but you can never know. Moreover, intimacy is something everyone does. Everyone does intimacy. Everyone in his dog does intimacy. So if you're offering into him intimacy, if you're offering the narcissist intimacy, you're actually telling the narcissist you're, actually, you're like everyone else. You're average. You're common. There's no bigger insult. Narcissists react with rage to two things. Ignoring them and implying directly or indirectly that they're not special. And intimacy does exactly this. It implies that the narcissist is not special, that he is in need of something, that you can get to know him, that he is graspable, that he is, you know, just human. Narcissists don't regard themselves as human. They regard themselves as perfect machinery or gods. So my next advice is look odd, you know, O-A-W-E, look odd by whatever attribute matters to him. For example, if he puts emphasis on his professional accomplishments, every time he mentions his profession or his accomplishments, look as though you are thunderstruck. Thunderstruck, nothing short of thunderstruck. Look like you are adulating and admiring him, prostrating himself before his implied divinity. Don't be afraid to overdo it. You can be as unsubtle, as obvious, as overt, and as manipulative, and as exaggerated, and as caricatured as you want to be, and the narcissist will not notice. Flattery, adulation, admiration will get you anywhere and everywhere with your narcissist. He's a kid. He's a child. He's a baby. If what matters to him is his good looks, keep telling him how handsome he is. If it's his professional accomplishments, tell him what a genius he is. If it's his success with women, tell him he's irresistible. Support his delusions. Enhance them. Amplify them. Agree with them. Get yourself incorporated in them. Show him the effect that his magnanimous benevolence has on you, that his divine deity-like attributes have on you. I mean, show him how you're transformed by his mere presence. Worship him. Worship him. Next advice. Never ever remind the narcissist of reality or of life out there. Because reality impinges on the narcissist's sense of grandiosity. Reality hurts. Reality is injurious. Reality keeps reminding the narcissist, you're so small. You're not as smart as you think. You're making, you're, you're fallible. You're fallible. You make mistakes. So don't remind the narcissist how fallible he is. Don't remind him of reality. He hates reality. He wants to divorce reality. He, narcissist withdraws from reality. He has an impaired reality testing and he constructs a fantastic bubble and he lives within this fantastic bubble he inhabits it he resides in it and this is his sense of grandiosity depends crucially on not being in touch with reality or on confirmation bias filtering out countervailing information injurious data and external mortification when people humiliate him or insult him or challenge him or criticize him or disagree with him he filters all this out it's like it had never happened. Don't remind him of it. The last don't do is do not make any comment which might directly impinge on his self-image, on his omnipotence, 
on his judgment, good judgment, on his omniscience, on his skills, his capabilities, his professional record, or even on his omnipresence. He knows everything. He is everywhere. He is all-powerful. He is the most, most perfect, most brilliant, most handsome, most everything. Go along with that. Conform, confirm, accept, uphold, buttress, amplify, add. Bad sentences start with the words, I think you may have overlooked, or maybe you made a mistake here, or I don't know if you know, but, or you were not here yesterday, so, or you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that. All these things are rude, injurious, challenging, hurtful, frustrating, and above all, malevolent. You become a persecutory object. You're out to get him. You're out to ruin him. You're out to... You're a plus, it makes you look stupid. I mean, you're an idiot if you can't grasp his, his magnificence. If you can't grasp the narcissist's perfection and brilliance, his genius, his irresistibility, something's wrong with you. Maybe he made a mistake. Maybe you're not the right partner. Narcissists react very badly to restriction placed on their freedom and to challenges to their grandiosity. Um, generally speaking, don't start sentences with the first pronoun. Don't start sentences with the word I, my, mine. You don't exist as an autonomous entity. You have no personal autonomy. You're not independent. You're an extension. You are not separate from the narcissist. You have merged and fused with him. You are a construct within his mind. You're an internal object. The, anytime you say I, it reminds him that you are outside him, that you are not controlled by him, that you may hurt him by abandoning him. Narcissists have object inconstancy. They fear abandonment and separation because they're babies. Babies fear abandonment and separation out of sight, out of mind. Never mention the fact, the fact that you are separate, independent entity. Narcissists regard other people as extensions and their internalization processes were screwed up. They don't differentiate properly between themselves and the world. The narcissists in this sense are nothing short of psychotic. They confuse internal objects and external objects and you're internal. I hope you get the gist of it. This is what not to do. To not do. Now, what about what to do? How to make your narcissist dependent on you? How to um, how to make him want to stay with you? If you insist on staying with him, of course, which is highly counterproductive and self-destructive. But it's your choice. I respect your choice. I recognize your personal autonomy. <laughs> Maybe I'm not a narcissist. Who knows? So, how to how to make him want you? How to make him never leave you? Number one. Listen attentively to everything the narcissist says. Agree with everything he says. Even if he says it's evening and it's morning, it's evening. Narcissists are never wrong. They are the only ones who can change, who can review, who can revise, who can modify and alter what they had said. You don't have these rights. You don't have administrator rights. You are a user. You're a client, but not an administrator. So he rules the computer. You can't hack. You can't enter. You are not allowed to disagree. Even if he makes the most outlandish, egregiously insane and idiotic statements, counterfactual, you must accept them, agree with them enthusiastically and vehemently, and even add to them, support them. You don't have to believe what he says. You don't have to believe a word the narcissist says, but let it slide. Let it slide as if everything is just fine. Business as usual. Advice number two. Personally offer something absolutely unique to the narcissist, which they cannot obtain anywhere else. If he likes kinky sex, be more kinky than sexual. If he likes food, cook ceaselessly a variety of cuisines. Always be prepared to line up future sources of primary narcissistic supply for your narcissist because you will not be it for very long if at all you need 
to become a source of sources. You need to become a database of potentials. He needs to refer to you as he would refer to Google. You need to become a search engine. If you take over the procure procuring function, if you take over the scouting function, if you take over casing the joints for the narcissist, they become that much more dependent on you, which makes it a bit tougher for them to pull their haughty stuff, um, which they will do in any case, but much less so. The more the narcissist is dependent on you, the less he will abuse you, and the less he will take the risk that you will abandon or dump him. Advice number three, be endlessly patient. Endlessly patient. It's a child, a young child. The average mental age of most narcissists is between four and six. So be endlessly patient. Remember your own children, if you have any. Remember when they were four. Go out of your way to accommodate the narcissist. Keep the narcissistic supply flowing liberally and keep the peace, relatively speaking. Use child psychology techniques. Uh, interact with your narcissist as you would have interacted with a baby. Be endlessly giving. Be endlessly giving. You may find this a very unattractive proposition, but it's a take it or leave it proposition. You have to give, give, and give, and you have to be ready to receive nothing in return. Your position is to give. Your reward, the prize, the gratification is in giving. You need to be a giving person. You need to be needed, as Lydia Vangelovska puts it. You need to, to feel that by catering to someone else's needs, your narcissist in this case, you are the one who is being fulfilled. And it's not altruism. It's actually a form of control codependence control via giving. So this way you will control your narcissist. The more you give, the more he is under your thumb, the more you can manipulate him. Next, be absolutely emotionally and financially independent of the narcissist. I repeat this. Be emotionally independent, emotionally independent of the narcissist. Don't let him regulate your emotions and stabilize your labile moods. Don't make him the source of your inner internal regulation. And do your best to gradually build up financial independence. Steal money from him and put it away. In some countries it's called the black fund. You know, save money, steal money here and there. Put it away for a rainy day. Make sure you have a reserve. Take what you need. Take the excitement. Take the engulfment. Refuse to get upset, refuse to get hurt when the narcissist does or says something dumb, rude or insensitive, and he will. He will. He will because he recognizes no boundaries and he does not recognize it as a separate entity. He's talking to himself. He's talking to your representation in his mind, something that I call snapshot. You're an internal object. He can't, by definition, hurt you or slight you or humiliate you or insult you. He can't be you can't be rude to yourself. And yelling back sometimes works well. This is part of my mirroring technique. But you should reserve this to special occasions if you don't want to erode, erode the eff efficaciousness of this technique. The more you use it, the more it's like inflation with money, you know. The more money you print, the less valuable the money. The more you yell back, the less it has effect. Use it on special occasions when you fear that your narcissist may be on the verge of leaving you. Silent treatment is a better ordinary response, but it must be carried out without any emotional content. You must be detached, you must be cold, you must be impervious, you must be ap apathetic and indifferent. You must, be, you must appear to be bored with him. And I'll talk to you later when I'm good and ready and when you are behaving in a more reasonable fashion and just walk away. Use manipulative techniques. The only way to survive in a relationship with a narcissist is to counter his manipulations with yours, leverage his manipulations against him. 
like in martial arts, use the enemy's, the enemy's force and power and momentum against him. If your narcissist is cerebral and he's not interested in, in sex, what should you do now? Well, give yourself ample permission to cheat on him, to have hidden sex with other people. Be discreet, don't be injurious, don't be ostentatious, but you need sex. Do not deny your needs if you feel like having sex. He doesn't give it to you, you have a full moral right to look for it elsewhere. Your cerebral narcissist will not be indifferent to infidelity. So discretion and secrecy is of paramount importance. But there's a difference between discretion and secrecy and deception. Usually cerebral narcissists and, and their spouses or intimate partners or mates, they settle into something called don't ask, don't tell. Don't rub it in his face, but don't deceive. There's no need to deceive. He will never, he doesn't care. He will never even ask you anything. You go out, you come in, who cares? Who, he doesn't care who you're with. On the contrary, by the way, he's relieved. This chore is someone else's problem, some other man's problem. And if your narcissist is somatic and you don't mind, join in in endlessly interesting group sex encounters. Make sure to choose properly for your narcissist because they are indiscriminate. They don't care about sexually transmitted diseases and so on. Better to control the situation. I know you, you find this particular advice very off-putting and even shocking. What? I will participate in threesomes? I will swing with my narcissist? Or I will agree to kinky sex, humiliation, sadistic sex? No way. Well, if you don't, he will go ahead anyhow. But he will go ahead anyhow without your control, without your knowledge. He will bring home diseases. He will do horrible things. He will give all your money to someone. You must control him as a child. And the only way to control the narcissist is to co-opt him, to cooperate with him, to collaborate with him, to become a part of his world. If he's into group sex, so should you. If he's into threesomes, you should be one of the three. And if he needs sexual partners outside the marriage, outside the diet, outside the... the then, you know, procure. Bring him your friends. Bring him some other people. You must control the situation. Um, they're heedless. They're very undiscriminating in respect of sexual partners. And that can get very um, problematic. Not only sexual STDs, but for example, blackmail. If you're a fixer, then focus on fixing, not the narcissist, but fixing situations. Preferably before they become situations. Do not attempt to fix your narcissist for two reasons. He's not fixable. And the second reason, he's going to resent it really badly. It's going to create a lot of friction and a lot of conflict. And then he's going to dump you because he would perceive this as a challenge to his grandiosity, constant challenge to his grandiosity. So let it go. Let it slide. Ignore it. Focus on objectives, on goals, on situations. Fix what needs fixing. Ignore your narcissist. Don't for one moment delude yourself that you can fix the narcissist. It simply will not happen. Not because they are being stubborn. They just simply can't be fixed. End of story. Not every problem has a solution. Narcissism is one problem that has no solution. Not even cold therapy. My new treatment modality, cold therapy, doesn't cure narcissism. It eliminates the need for grandiosity and it destroys the false self. That's it. If there is any fixing, fixing that can be done, it is to help your narcissist become aware of their condition. That you can do gradually, gently, subtly, patiently, lovingly, compassionately, without challenging, not head-on, not in a confrontation, confrontational manner, and not in a narcissistic manner. Don't be grandiose. So, But you can gradually make him become aware of his condition. It's very important. Don't go into negative implications, into accusations in the process. Don't. Make it positive psychology, not negative psychology. It is like living with a physically handicapped person and being able to discuss calmly, unemotionally, what the limitations and benefits of the handicap are, of the disability. 
and how the two of you can work with these factors with his disability rather than trying to change his disability if someone is quadriplegic the only thing you can change is the wheelchair change the wheelchair finally and most importantly of all you should know yourself you focus too much too much on him all victims focus too much on the abuser they refuse to see themselves and their contribution to what had happened what is it happening they deny sometimes ferociously sometimes malevolently their own narcissism and their own uh, unsavory behaviors you must know yourself it's a source a fount of power what are you getting out of the relationship are you actually a masochist maybe codependent perhaps why is this relationship attractive to you why is it interesting define for yourself what good and beneficial things you believe you are receiving in this relationship define the things that you find harmful bad for you develop strategies to minimize this harm this hurt this pain the evil aspects don't expect that you will cognitively be able to reason with the narcissists to change who they are you can't negotiate with them you can't agree with them they break promises and contracts because they have no constancy you you don't honor a contract with someone who 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 phases in and out of existence <laughs> i mean you're out of sight you're out of mind you don't exist you're back you exist how do you maintain continuity when you're in a permanent state of inconstancy in dissociation it's hopeless don't make agreements with the narcissists contracts compacts promises decisions it's ridiculous what are you negotiating with the four-year-old you may have some limited success in getting your narcissist to tone down on the really abrasive and harmful behaviors the behaviors that affect you which emanate from the unchangeable the immutable what the narcissist is his essence so we can modify behavior you can modify behavior to some extent don't expect too much this can only be accomplished in a very trusting frank and open relationship and i want to suggest to you a few resolutions personal resolutions new year resolutions if you wish resolutions are notoriously fragile and ephemeral but victims of abuse cannot afford this cavalier attitude your mental and too often physical health they depend on strictly observing the following promises to yourself number one i will treat myself with dignity i will demand respect from others i will not allow anyone to disrespect me number two i will set clear boundaries and i will make known to other people what i regard as permissible and acceptable behavior and what is off limits and out of bounds number three I will not tolerate abuse. I will not tolerate aggression in any shape, form, or, or disguise. I will seek to terminate such misconduct instantly and unequivocally. If I can't, I'll walk away. Number four, I will be assertive and unambiguous about my needs, wishes, and expectations from other people. I will not be arrogant, but I will be confident. I will be assertive. I will not be self-effacing. I will not be meek. I will not be selfish, I will not be grandiose, I will not be narcissistic, I will not be haughty, but I will love myself, I will care for myself, I come first in the best sense of the word. For me to love others, I must love myself, for me to care for others, I must first take care of myself. Number five, I will get to know myself better, I will study myself, I will make myself into a topic of study, I will make my, render myself my project. Number six, I will treat other people as I want them to treat me. That's a very ancient wisdom. I will try to lead by way of self example, by way of example. Number seven, if I am habitually disrespected, regularly abused, or if my boundaries are constantly ignored and breached, I will go no contact. I will break up. I will terminate the relationship with the abuser forthwith zero tolerance zero tolerance first strike and you're out and no second chance would be my maxims for self-preservation i wish you luck with your narcissist it's not an easy ride some of you think that it's the only ride in town you're wrong 
There are many buses where this one has departed. But you insist to ride a specific bus? Polluted, dirty, infected? It's your choice. At least do it properly. The other day, I came across an amazing, unprecedented phenomenon. A comment on one of my YouTube videos that I failed to delete. <laughs> it's a pleasure, you know, I can't control it. Okay, Shoshanim, what did the comment say? Sam, that's me. How exactly does the intimate partner regulate the borderline's emotions? How does the regulation occur? What does the partner do to affect emotional regulation in the borderline? Now, I coined the phrase external regulation to describe a form of internal regulation. And I did this in order to discombobulate you. Look it up. External regulation is when the process of internal regulation is misattributed to an external source. Now, in healthy, normal people, the control of moods, emotions, interaction with reality, reality testing, etc., all these come from the inside. There is a, a sensation, there's a feeling, there's an experience of innate control, inherent, something that is embedded somewhere in your in your chest or something. In external control, the control of moods, emotions, reality testing, cognitions, you name it, emotions uh, uh, are the main thing, but many other things are being regulated on a, on, a, on a regular basis. So, in external regulation, the internal processes of regulation continue apace, exactly like in normal or healthy people, but the individual firmly believes that the regulation is coming from the outside. There is, this is a kind of misattribution, misattribu or if you wish, kind of attribution error. And this is the topic of today's video. How does the borderline experience this regulation that is coming from the outside, the hand, the hand of God, if you wish. What is, what is taking place in her mind or his mind? Half of all borderlines are men. What is taking place in her mind when she interacts with someone she believes is reaching inside, reaching inside her brain, inside her mind and rearranging the furniture? How does it feel? What does she feel? How does she interpret it? What kind of narrative or story is she telling herself? That's the topic of today's video. And who better qualified to discuss it than moi? Moi, Sam Vaknin, author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, the first book ever on narcissistic abuse, and a professor of clinical psychology in multiple universities lately. <laughs> okay. Let's delve right in. We all have a regulatory system. Regulatory system are a group, a set of interacting mechanisms that act in order to maintain equilibrium, homeostasis, any other stable state. So regulation or within or mediated via the regulatory system is about stability. The main purpose of regulation is to maintain stability. Even, even financial regulation, for example, the Fed, um, national banks, even financial regulation is about maintaining stability. Now, human beings regulate many things all the time physiologically, but also psychologically and mentally, processes that happen in the brain. They regulate, people for example, regulate consciousness. There are many activities taking place within your mind that are aimed at managing or changing the state and contents of consciousness. Avoiding pain, seeking pleasure, uh, seeking thrills, risks and variety, etc. etc. Self-destructive activities, 
self-harming, chemical intoxication, self-mutilation, substance abuse. They are also forms of efforts, attempts to regulate states of consciousness. They are self-destructive, self-defeating, they are dysfunctional, they are wrong, but they are still about regulation. It's everything, many of the things we do have to do with this desperate need to keep the, the environment, the internal environment, stable, fixed, predictable. What the borderline does, she outsources her ego functions, functions that normally take place within the individual, in what was known in psychoanalytic literature as the ego. These functions are relegated to the outside. A typical borderline would outsource these functions to an intimate partner or a special friend, a special person. Someone with whom she can feel, she feels safe to experience intimacy and to expose her vulnerabilities. These kind of people are rare. And when the borderline finds them, she unburdens herself. She stops to exist in a way. She deactivates herself. And she allows these people from the outside to interfere, intervene in her internal landscape, in her inner space, and carry out the functions that should she should have carried autonomously. This is a symbiotic relationship and we'll discuss it a bit later. The transfer of ego functions to the outside, to an intimate partner, to a special friend, to a special person, the transfer, this by the way happens in autism to some extent, this transfer of ego functions is utterly automatic. It's not a decision, it's not like the borderline sits alone at home eating a TV meal and debates with herself whether to kind of uh, convey her ego functions to someone <laughs> or relegate them to someone. This is not the way it works. When she comes across someone who fulfills the criteria, and I refer you to my video about uh, managing the borderline enchantress, <laughs> when she finds someone who meets the criteria, she automatically dislodges her ego functions, transfers them to that person, and becomes a passive recipient, receptacle, a container or of the other person's decisions, activities, choices, personality, predilections, and so on. She becomes a blank canvas upon which the other person can paint himself or herself. She's 100% responsive to cues and stimuli from the outside. It's a very interesting transformation to behold. And it involves the following, the regulation of emotions and moods. The other person, the special friend, the special person, the, the intimate partner, the other person is granted absolute power to alter the moods or, and to control the emotions, to evoke them, to silence them, to trigger them, to deactivate them, total control over the operating system of the borderline. With a single word, this specific individual can plunge the borderline into complete depression and despair or into narcissistic elation of indescribable proportions. Power is infinite unlimited, exorbitant, if you wish. The same effect on the borderline's moods applies to her emotions. That person from the outside, the external regulator, can trigger and provoke and elicit any emotion, negative or positive, love or hatred, fear or a sense of safety, anything, envy, compassion, it is as if the borderline's mind has been transmitted remotely into someone else to do with as he or she please, pleases. 
and gradually with time protocols emerge keywords uh, triggers buttons to to be pushed the two parties settle into a kind of ritual where one of them has all the power and the other one controls that person from the bottom via her helplessness and neediness and clinging it's very reminiscent of codependent dynamics the borderline signals her needs for example now she needs to be elated or now she wants to experience a modicum of depression and despair or now she wants to feel love or now she hates or needs to hate and then she expects the partner to respond in kind to push the right buttons to say the right words to behave in specific ways when she experiences engulfment anxiety the partner is supposed to walk away when she experiences abandonment anxiety the partner is supposed to be 100 percent of the time present when she wants to when she loves the partner he is supposed to act in a lovable way when she hates the partner he is supposed to be not become obnoxious the partner is molded by the expectations of the borderline while maintaining the power to gratify or satisfy or realize these expectations the self-actualization of the borderline is a derivative of the decisions and choices made by the intimate partner or the special friend within a ritualized highly structured context and again watch the video about the enchantress the link is in the description it is a cult-like situation it's a paracosm it's a shared fantasy and it drifts away from reality the longer the partners are enmeshed and embedded in this out of context decontextualized self-generated on the fly ambience and environment when the borderline is in this arrangement when she has found someone she could trust to regulate her from the outside or someone she could attribute to the regulation that actually takes place inside her when she finds someone like that and they have established their shared fantasy the borderline experiences a sense of unitary compl completion as if she has been partial a partial person and then she has found her complement she has found someone to complete her and to become unitary a single unit a single organism it's a holistic perception it's benign it's not like the narcissist takeover which is essentially hostile and exploitative it's not like the codependent codependence strategies which are Machiavellian in many cases and involve control in the case of the borderline it's more about submission it is true submission kind of Islam if you wish it is true submission that the borderline emerges into the wholeness into the completed perfection that is the symbiotic merger and fusion with the intimate partner or the special person at that point the borderline experiences something very rare for her and again i say her half of all borderlines are men the borderline experiences something very rare balance equilibrium homeostasis a secure base a sense of safety stability predictability the glimmer the glimmerings of object constancy the borderline is incapable of experiencing introject constancy in other words she is incapable of creating stable representations of other people in her mind she is capable of object constancy but she is distrustful of people she's terrified 
of exposing her vulnerabilities, of being hurt, rejected, abandoned, humiliated, shamed. She's, she's terrorized by the potential of other people to harm her somehow. She therefore avoids to the best of her ability intimacy unless it is with someone who she then designates the special person or the special friend or the intimate partner. So very few get chosen. A borderline may fleet, may like a butterfly, you know, alight on multiple people, but she doesn't really become herself very often, takes a special kind of partner. And then when she feels this internal resettling, internal uh, settling actually, not resettling, internal settling, internal cohesion, internal correspondence, internal resonance that is all-encompassing, all-pervasive, ubiquitous and yet warm, accepting, embracing. It is only then that she allows herself to experience object constancy with her loved one with her special one and that feels utterly oceanic it's like going back to the womb and we will discuss in a minute the parental implications of this but it's like going back to the matrix to the womb and it is this exactly that triggers in the borderline her engulfment anxiety by going back to the womb she is being unborn. She is annihilating herself, annulling, annulling herself. By merging and fusing symbiotically with her loved one, the borderline vanishes. She gradually transitions from full-fledged organism to a single ovum or sperm or whatever. And then not even that. There's a risk of disappearing altogether. And this creates engulfment anxiety and the famous approach avoidance repetition compulsion. It's all about the avoidance and mitigation of pain. The motivating force, if you wish, the motivating dynamic, the motivating emotional landscape in the borderline's life is hurt and pain, agonizing, excruciating, debilitating fiery, consuming pain. And it is, her entire life is dedicated to the designing and implementation of strategies to skirt this pain, to avoid it, to mitigate it, to ameliorate it, to ignore it, to deny it, to reframe it, to do something with it. When she finds a person to love, when she finds an intimate partner or a special person or a special friend or what have you, she allows herself to feel the pain. She allows herself to feel the pain. She perceives love as pain. She perceives love as a form of slavery, addiction. It's painful. It's a painful experience. And her solution is to infant, self-infantilize. She, she regresses. She becomes an infant, a toddler, then an infant, then a, then a newborn, then in the womb. She infantilizes, regresses, almost to a previous incarnation, if you believe in this kind of nonsense. And at that point, she expects the intimate partner or the special friend to assume the parental role and the parental discourse. She childify herself. <laughs> she reduces herself into a childlike state fully expecting the other partner to respond in kind by becoming a parental figure and engaging in parental speech. And so this is the way she avoids the pain. It is as if she says, I'm a child, don't hurt me. Or as if she says, I'm a child, I'm incapable of understanding the profundity and extent of adult pain. And so having having been consumed by her intimate partner, by her lover, by her special friend, 
have been consumed, subsumed, assumed, having merged and fused, having become this perfection, which is holistic and which is a secure base, safe, stable, determinate, predictable. This introduces structure and order into the borderlines, otherwise utterly chaotic personality organization, world and life. It reduces the chaos. It's an anti-chaos um, strategy. And within this structure and order, she strikes a bargain. She negotiates a deal. It's a contract. It's not transactional. She's not a gold digger. It's not transactional, give and take. I'll give you sex, you give me money, for example. Not this kind of thing. But it is still contractual. There are rights. There are corresponding or commensurate duties. And there are rituals and protocols. And they're all very rigid and embedded. And any deviation, any divergence from this contractual landscape triggers the borderline, renders her extremely anxious, paralyzed with fear, anticipation, and injuries and mortifications. She's a very, borderline is a very, very, very fragile, fragile structure, very fragile person. And as distinct, as opposed to the narcissist, she does not have well-developed narcissistic defenses. And so she is, um, she is a kind of narcissist without the shell, a turtle without the shell. And this is why she keeps getting overwhelmed internally as well as externally. She has no defenses to speak of, except very primitive, infantile defenses, which are not up to the task. For example, splitting. She needs nurturance. She seeks satisfaction and gratification of her wishes and aspirations, dreams and hopes and fantasies, accomplishments. She needs a horizon. She needs hope. The borderline's relationship with her loved ones is a relationship of eternal hope. Springs. Hope springs eternal there. It's not malignant optimism. The borderline is pretty grounded in some ways because she is highly paranoid and suspicious. She sees through, she sees through people. I mean, most people are transparent to the borderline, but she wants some hope because she is by nature depressive and even suicidal. She needs some counterpoint. She requires some counterweight. And it is the role of the intimate partner to provide her with hope. It is the mere presence of the partner. The partner doesn't have to do much, honestly. It is the mere presence of the partner that is sufficient. The mere constancy of the object, the mere existence, the mere, the mere availability of the partner or the loved one or the special person, they're enough. They're enough to ignite in her a flame of hope. And it is not a consuming flame. It is an energizing flame. It is the warmth in a cold winter day. And this is how she perceives the relationship. Like some, some kind of a flame. A flame that, is, that keeps, you, keeps you warm. A flame that keeps away the wild animals. A flame around which you can tell stories, narratives that comfort, that reduce anxiety, that make the world habitable. It's like a campfire. The intimate partner has to intercede with reality. Reality is intermediated via the intimate partner or via the special person. The borderline has no access to reality, no contact with reality, except through the intermediation and intercession of other people, people she trusts. I call it vicarious reality testing. We know a lot about regulation, regulatory functions. There is even a theory known as regulatory focus theory. 
Regulatory focus theory is a conceptual framework. It discusses motivation and behavior. The theory suggests that people are fundamentally either promotion-oriented or prevention-oriented. When people make decisions and choices, when they pursue certain courses of action, when they anticipate consequences and outcomes, when they position themselves, when they um, adopt goals and so on and so forth, they're either focused on prevention or focused on promotion. And according to the theory, promotion-focused self-regulation is concerned with nurturance, with accomplishment of needs, and with the pursuit of wishes and aspirations. This, the borderline, is incapable of except through the intermediation of another person. The promotion-focused self-regulation results in sensitivity to positive outcomes and to relative pleasure from gains. Freud would have called it the pleasure principle. Prevention-focused self-regulation is concerned with safety and security needs and is focused on meeting duties and obligations. It results in sensitivity to negative outcomes and to relative pain from losses. And this is this is exactly the internal landscape of the borderline. She is prevention focused. Her self-regulation is intended to prevent pain and other adverse consequences. And so the theory says that your disposition towards either obtaining gains or avoiding losses influences your dominant motivations and affects your behavioral choices. And this is exactly what happens with the borderline. Her propensity, her disposition towards preventative measures, avoiding pain, reducing stress, uh, walking away from untoward, adverse, dangerous circumstances, uh, not dangerous, but uh, unpleasant circumstances. This attitude, attitudinal, motivational space of the borderline causes her to adopt strategies which relegate promotion, promotional self-regulation to an intimate partner or a loved one or a special friend. It's as if the borderline says, I am half a person. As I am, all alone, I'm half a person. I'm capable of only of preventing. I'm capable of preventing loss and pain, but, but I'm incapable of making myself happy. I'm incapable of experiencing pleasure. And so I need you, my intimate partner. I need you, my special, special person. I need you, my loved one. I need you to bring pleasure and happiness into my life. And it is via pleasure and happiness that I regulate my internal environment that I avoid, for example, suicidality. And this is more or less the deal between the borderline and her, her loved ones, her nearest, dearest and closest. And when we apply regulatory focus theory to borderline, we understand the borderline's communication patterns, her the way she organizes her life, the organizational principles that control her life, the way she performs tasks, many things. I will not go into them right now. I hope I've answered the question that this video started with. It's not easy. It's not easy to understand or accept a person who vacates herself, empties herself on purpose. She kind of accepts her emptiness, her void, the black hole, which is her essence, and tries to fill it in, tries to negate it somehow via other people. But she does it intentionally and deliberately, strategically. And so it's the equivalent of embracing the emptiness as a tool of motivating people to negate it. This is the paradoxical nature of the borderline's existence. She is an emptiness. She seeks to destroy herself by destroying this emptiness. And she derives pleasure 
satisfaction, comfort, a sense of safety, all the positive emotions, love, by destroying the emptiness that she is. It's a paradoxical strategy. The only way for you to be happy is to not be anymore.